Professor, can I ask you a real quick question? Before sure. Uh, what's happening with the U.S. oil prices, and what does the negative? Well, it's, it's, it's the fact is that the, we're, we've run out of storage for oil. So basically the problem is right now if you buy oil, there's no place to put it. So nobody wants to buy oil. So it's, that's why if you look at the forward curve, usually future oil prices, it's the spot price times one, you know, it's a function of risk-free rate and storage cost. But storage cost, there's no way to, nowhere to store the oil. So that's a promise. The oil keeps getting pumped out because you can't stop oil wells suddenly. So the oil, but there's no demand for oil because people are not driving, you know. So we ran out of storage space. So it's a, it's, a, it's a problem, it's not a permanent problem obviously, but for the next few months until people start to use oil, you're gonna have trouble storing the oil. So that's what it is. Thank you, thank you. Um, Raphael, do you wanna ask the question? Just um, unmute yourself and ask the question because I think it's a general enough question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I had a question regarding the so finding the comparable firms. Yeah. So I understand that we, we don't need necessarily to be in the same industry, but rather we're looking for some uh, for another yeah. company for other companies that have similar cash flows and growth. Uh, but do we need to be in the same currency? You know, if we're doing a US. What, what number do you, you know, use in, in multiples that is currency? So uh, everything is a ratio, right? So there is no currency. So PE ratio, there is no currency to a PE ratio. There's no currency to a return on equity. There's no currency to a margin. So since there are no dollar values or euro values or currency values involved, you can compare across countries and different currencies. You might have to control for differences in fundamentals and growth and risk across countries, but there's no 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 limitation on currencies. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks, any starting questions before we begin? Okay, so let me get started. We're on packet three. I don't know whether you have been able to download it, but even if you haven't, we're just going to cover the first 35 slides. So download it when you do get a chance, because today we're going to talk about the third way in which you can put a number to a company. The first two ways are intrinsic value and pricing. The third way is real options. So lay the foundations for using option pricing, not to value options, but actually value businesses and companies, we have to do some homework. Basically, we've got to kind of lay out what an option is, what, what makes options different from other assets, and how to price an option. So at the risk of repeating what you might have heard in a previous class, let me lay the foundations. The underlying theme in the entire real options discussion is when you do a traditional discounted cash flow evaluation, whether it's of a project to compute the net present value or of a company to value a company, you're making a judgment as of right now. You're asking, what is this company worth? What is this project worth if I invest in it today? And the people who are real options purists argue that you're missing some optionality. Optionality to what? the option added to delay. You could have a project be a bad project today, but the rights to that bad project could be worth money because that bad project could become a good project in the future. You have the right to expand a project. That's your option to expand. It could be an option to defer, an option to abandon. That implicit when you look at decisions, there are these options that were missing with traditional discounted cash flow evaluation. They are right. And I'm going to lay the intuitive foundations for why sometimes you might have to attach a premium to a discounted cash flow model because that's where we're going. With real options, we're saying you can do a DCF value for a company, but sometimes, just sometimes, you might have to add a premium to that DCF value because of the option added in the company. So let me give you a very simple illustration of where the roots of real options come from. So let me show you a decision tree, very simple decision tree. Okay? So here you are, you're right here today. There's a 50% chance of success, a 50% chance of failure. If you succeed, you'll make 100 million. If you fail, you lose 120 million. What's the expected value of this decision? Anybody? An easy one. Minus 10, right? 0. 0.5 times 100 plus 0. 0.5 times minus 120. Now I'm going to take the same decision tree and break it up into two branches. So in the first branch, there's a 75% chance of success, which can make plus 20, and a 25% chance of losing money, where you make minus 20. If you get a minus 20 outcome in the first branch of the tree, you stop. 
If you get a plus 20, you continue. And if you continue, there's a two-third chance of making 80 and a one-third chance of making minus 100. The two trees are not essentially equivalent, but if you think about it, there's now still a 50% chance, three-quarters times two-thirds, of making 100, the sum of those two, and a 50% chance of losing 120. So it looks, at least on the surface, like the two investments are pretty similar, right, in terms of upside and downside. But here's the magic. The expected value of this investment is actually slightly positive. So if you remember, the previous investment I got minus 10, somehow by breaking it into two branches, I've made a bad investment into a good investment. So I have a question. Why? What is it about the second investment that is making the bad investment into a good investment? What happens in the second scenario? Anybody want to try? Unmute yourself and kind of jump in. Why does the second investment have higher probability of success? No, it's actually three quarters times two thirds. Same 50% chance of success, 50% chance of failure. What is it that makes the second? What is it that I can do in the second investment that I don't do in the first? I do a small trial. I think of it like a market test. The market test doesn't work out. Now, Will, as Will mentioned, I can stop. I'm, there are two things in the second investment that make it more valuable. First is there's learning going on because I have that first branch. If I learn that I get a negative outcome, I stop right away. On the, and then there's adaptive behavior. I change my behavior in the second step because of what I learned in the first step. Those two aspects are what make for real options. There's learning and adaptive behavior. Let me make this less abstract. Eh? Let's assume you're an oil company. When I do a traditional discounted cash flow valuation of an oil company, I project out the oil production, I multiply by an expected oil price, I come up with expected cash flows, I discount them all back to today and I come up with the value for the oil company today. Right? Production times oil price, subtract out the cost, come up with cash flows, discount them back. You know what I'm missing when I do that? Oil companies are not on autopilot in terms of what they produce, right? What do they get to observe before they decide how much to produce? They get to observe the oil price. If the oil price is $10 a barrel, as it is right now, if they can not produce, guess what they're doing? They're stopping production. If oil price is $100 a barrel, they produce a lot more. In other words, they're learning from looking at the oil price and changing the way they behave based on that. Those two aspects are what make for real options. So I'm going to concede that there are option cases where I'd apply an, an option premium, as in the case of an oil company. But I'm going to lay the foundations for doing this right. I'm going to argue that there are three questions we need to address and answer before we can bring out the option pricing technology to add value to a company. First is, we have to answer the question, when is there an option in a decision? When should we even, even be talking about option pricing? Second. When does that option have significant economic value? We're going to add some requirements and we're going to find that for every 10 options we run into, maybe two have significant e economic value. And third, once you, you accept that there is an option that has significant economic value, when can I estimate that value using an option pricing model? So when is there an option? When does that option have significant economic value? When can I use an option pricing model to estimate that value? Let's start with that first question. When is there an option embedded in a decision? To understand that, you've got to go back to the definitions of what makes an option an option. With an option, here's what you get. You get the right to buy or sell something at a fixed price. With a call option, you get the right to buy at a fixed price. The sell option, you get the right to sell at a fixed price. So to understand whether there's an option, you first have to rem remember that options are derivative assets. They derive their value from an underlying asset. That's, they're leeches. Without the underlying asset, there's no option. The second is, they give you a right, not an obligation. You get the right to do something, but you're not required to do it. So you get the right to buy something at a fixed price, but you don't have to do that if the price drops. So hang on just a moment. I'm gonna let my dog out. <clears throat> So 
So for an option to exist, there's got to be an underlying asset. There's got to be a specified price, a fixed price, and there's got to be a finite life. Options can't last forever. Underlying asset, fixed price, finite life. And to see whether there's an option, the best way to, to recognize an option is to think in terms of payoff diagrams. You're saying, what the heck are you talking about? Remember what a, call, a payoff diagram and a call option looks like? You should have done this in foundations or in earlier finance class, but even if you have it, what makes call options and put options unique is the payoff diagram as a kink in it. The kink happens at the strike price. If the stock price exceeds the strike price, then of course you exercise the option, you make money. If the stock price is less than the strike price, and here's where options are unique, you have limited losses. You cannot be required to pay more than what you paid up front for the option. So if I have an asset with a cash flow diagram that looks like this, I don't care what I call the asset, there's an option idea. One of the things you're going to see me do with every real option I'm going to describe is I'm going to draw the payoff diagram so you can see that it looks just like this payoff diagram. And that's why we're using option pricing in that context. This is with a call where you get the right to buy at a fixed price. So because you get the right to buy that strike price, if the stock price ends up being higher, you exercise the right, you claim the difference. With a put option, you get the right to sell at a fixed price. There, if the stock price drops below the strike price, dollar for dollar, you make profits. But if it's above the strike price, again, your losses are limited to whatever you paid for the option. So keep that in mind. One of the things that makes call and put options unique is you have limited losses. So the payoff diagram, because of that, is going to make these very different kinds of assets than traditional assets where the cash flows can go up and down and the payoff diagram kind of stretches in both directions. So the first thing we're going to look for is, the, is there something that looks like those payoff diagrams? If there is, we're going to argue that there is an option. Here's the second stop. And this to me is a critical step. Getting the right to do something is not worth anything if everybody gets that same right. Let me give you a story, a kind of a silly story to illustrate this. About 15 years ago, one of my second year MBAs who's graduating comes to me, he's very excited. He says, look, I live in an apartment that I rent and my landlord has given me the right to buy the apartment any time over the next year. It's given me the option to buy the apartment any time over the next year. And I want to value the option using a Black Scholes option pricing model. And I said, aren't you getting a little carried away? And he said, well, I paid a lot for this MBA. I want to use it. With no, I want to use a Black Scholes option pricing model. I said, okay. He said, what, did you, what price did your landlord say you could buy the apartment at any time over the next year? And the MBA thought for a moment. And he said, you know what? He never mentioned the price. So I asked him a follow-up question. I said, what do you think the option to buy your apartment at whatever the prevailing market price is worth? Now think about it. Anybody can buy the apartment at the prevailing market price. There's nothing special about it. That is not an option. So the key for an option is you have to have exclusivity. You and only you have to be able to do it. And the further you get away from that exclusivity, the less value there is to the option. For the moment, that sounds abstract. But as we describe real options, this is one of the tests we're going to run is do you have exclusivity? So when you talk about the option to do something, I'm going to stop and ask you what makes you special? What makes you think you and only you can do this? Because that's what's going to drive the value of this option. So when is there an option? Look for the payoff diagram. Is there exclusivity that drives value? And if you decide that the option is value, then we know what determines the value of an option. We've known for about 50 years now since Black and Scholes first came out in the option pricing model. The value of an option is driven by six and only six variables. Three of those variables relate to the underlying asset. As the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, the value of options will also go up and down. Think of why. With a call, you get the right to buy at a fixed price, right? So if the value of the underlying asset goes up, the values of calls will go up. But with a put, you get the right to sell at a fixed price. Value of puts should go down. So value of the underlying asset. Second, the variance in the value of the underlying asset. As that variance increases, both calls and puts will become more valuable. This is where options are different from any other assets. Risk usually reduces value in a DCF model or in pricing, but with options, risk becomes your ally. Why? Because your downside is limited. Remember the payoff diagrams, you could not lose more than what you paid up front. So value, value the underlying asset, variance of value, the higher the variance, both calls and puts become more valuable. 
And the third is any dividends you expect on the underlying asset will affect the value of options and here's why. With a call, you get the right to buy shares. In a st in, uh, you get the right to buy the underlying shares, right? The underlying stock. When that stock is expected to pay a dividend, here's what happens on the ex-dividend day. When the stock pays a dividend, the stock price drops by roughly the amount of the dividend. So we have call options. Any expected dividends on the asset would reduce the value of call options, but they will increase the value of put options. So value of the underlying asset varying from the value in any expected dividends on the underlying asset. There are two variables relating to the option itself that drive the value of the option. The first is the strike price. Since with a call you get the right to buy at that price, the lower that price, the more valuable the call option. Since with a put they get, you get the right to sell at that price, the lower that strike price, the less valuable the put option. So basically, with strike prices, the higher the strike price, the, the, more valuable, the less valuable call options become and the more valuable put options become. The second is the life of the option. If I give you the right to do something for only two months, it's worth less than giving you the right to do the same thing over a year. So options, both calls and puts, will become more valuable with a longer life. So two variables related to the option, the strike price and the life of the option. There's only one external variable. That's the level of interest rates. And here's why. With a call option, you get the right to buy something at a fixed price in the future, right? If interest rates go up, the present value of what you have to pay becomes smaller. So basically, that call option becomes more valuable as interest rates become higher. With a put, with a put you get the right to sell at a fixed price. And because the present value of that fixed price becomes lower at higher interest rates, so higher interest rates cut in opposite directions. Call options become more valuable when interest rates go up. Put options become less valuable. So six variables, three relating to the underlying asset, two to the option, one with the level of interest rates. Now we've known these variables, but we also want to think about using option pricing models to value options. And here, I want to give you a very quick introduction to option pricing models. Until the 1970s, people valued options just like they valued any other asset. They took expected cash flows and discounted back at a risk-adjusted discount rate. What Fisher, Black and Meyer and Schultz, Black and Schultz brought to the game was a very different perspective on options. They said, we can create something that looks exactly like the option in terms of cash flows by combining the underlying asset and the risk-free asset. He said, what are you talking about? Borrowing money and buying a certain number of units of the underlying asset, I can create something that looks exactly like my call option. It's called a replicating portfolio. It's replicating because I get cash flows that are exactly the same as my call option. So the first principle on which option pricing models are built is replication, that you can create something that looks like the option by combining the underlying asset and borrowing or lending. Now, to, to create that, under, that replicating portfolio, the underlying asset has to be traded, the option has to be traded, and you have to be able to borrow or lend money at close to the risk rate. Now, you can debate the last assumption, but the first two are actually much more critical assumptions, that you can trade the underlying asset and the option, you can create a replicating portfolio. The second principle on which option pricing models are built is arbitrage. So what are you talking about? Remember the replicating portfolio and the option have the same cash flows? If you have two investments with the same cash flows, they have to trade at the same price. Why? Because one traded at lower price than the other, you could do arbitrage. And here's what the arbitrage would involve. You would buy the cheaper asset, you'd sell the more expensive asset. Remember, they have the exact same cash flows. The cash, cash flows would offset each other. You can keep the difference and it's guaranteed profit. Replication arbitrage is what all option pricing models are built on. Now I could hit you with the black shows, but before I do the black shows, I'm going to use a much simpler way of illustrating where option pricing models come from. And to understand the notion of a replicating portfolio is critical to under in understanding option pricing models. So basically in replicating portfolio, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to borrow money and buy a certain number of units. Let's call it delta of the underlying stock. To create something that looks like a put, I'm going to sell short delta on an underlying asset and land. You're saying, what's delta and how much do I borrow? That's what the option pricing models will allow you to answer. So I'm going to use a very simple way of coming up with an option pricing model. It's called a binomial option pricing model. To understand a binomial model, first let's lay out what binomial means. 
Binomial means that your stock price can jump to only one of two points in the next moment of time. It's a very, very rigid model, but it's going to allow us to see where option pricing comes from. So let's say you have a stock that's trading at 50. In the next moment of time, it can either go to 70 or 35, only two possible outcomes. If it goes to 70, in the following time period, it can go to either 100 or 50. If it goes to 35, in the following time period, it can jump to 50 or drop to 25. So the end of time period two, this stock can be worth 25, 50, or 100. Right now it's at 50. You don't know where it'll end up, but let's say I came to you with a call option with a strike price of 40, expiring at t equal to two. So basically you get the right to buy the share at $40 at t equal to two and ask you how much would you be willing to pay for the option. We're going to use replication and arbitrage to value the option. But I want to make sure everybody's clear upon what you're getting. You're getting the right to buy the stock at $40 at t equal to two. Any questions on this on the setup? Okay. So now let's look at what the cash flows on the call would look like at t equal to two. Remember the strike price is 40. So if the stock price goes to 100, the call is going to be worth 60, right? Because you can buy the stock at 40 and sell it at 100. If it goes to 50, the call is going to make you 10. The stock goes to 25, the call is worth nothing. Let me ask you a question, why isn't it worth minus 15? You have the right to buy at 40, stock price drops to 25, why isn't the cash flow minus 15? Because you want to explain. This is exactly what makes options special, right? You get the right but not the obligation. You would not buy the stock at 40 if the stock's trading at 25. So the cash flows in the call is 60, 10 and 0. So here's my task. I want to create a replicating portfolio that has exactly the same cash flows as the call, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at the very last branch. So let's say the stock is 70. Okay? And you're going to see in a minute why I have to start at the last branch because I know the cash flows in the call with precision only at t equal to 2 because that's when it expires. Stock's at 70. I want to go out and borrow some money. Let's call that unknown B and buy certain shares. So let's call that delta. So B, I'm going to borrow B dollars and buy Delta shares of stock. You see, what the heck are you talking about? Let's do some algebra. If I borrow B dollars and buy Delta shares of stock at, when the stock is 70, if the stock goes to 100, here's what my portfolio is going to be worth. I own D shares of stocks, so 100 times D is what my stock is going to be worth. The interest rate on the debt is 11%, so I pay back whatever I borrowed with interest. So that's a 1.11 times B. Remember that I want to create something that looks exactly like the call in terms of cash flows. So my portfolio, 100 times D minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to the cash flow on the call, 60. If the stock goes to 50, 50 times delta minus my borrowing paid back has to be equal to 10. I know it's been a long, long, long time since you did simultaneous equations, but those are simultaneous equations, right? And if you, and it's a very simple simultaneous equation, if I solve for delta, I come up with delta of 1 and B of 36.04. You think, what the heck does that even mean? If I go out and borrow $36.04 and buy one share of stock at $70, I will create a portfolio that has exactly the same cash flows as the call. That portfolio would cost me $33.96, right? $1, $70. So one share of stock at 70 but I borrowed 36.04, so I've got to come up with 33.96. That becomes the value of the call if the stock price goes to 70. So now I have a value for the call if the stock goes to 70. I do the same thing if the stock goes to 35. 50 times D minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to 10. 25 times D minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to zero. I solve for delta. If the stock goes to 35, I need to create a replicating portfolio by borrowing $9.01 and buying 0.4 shares of stock. That position will cost me $4.99. That's going to be the value of my call if the stock goes to 35. Now do you see why I have to start at the tail end of the distribution and work backwards? I now have a value for the call at t equal to 1. I go back to t equal to 0. Stocks right now at 50. I say, what's my replicating portfolio? 70 times D minus 1.11 times B has to be equal to the value of the call at T equal to 1. If the stock goes to 35, 35 times D minus 1.11 times B is equal to 499. I solve for D and B and here's what I end up with. If today, 
and the stock is 50, I go out and borrow $21.61 and buy 0.8278 shares. Don't even ask me how you buy 0.8278 shares of stock. If I could, I would create something that looks exactly like the call all the way through the slide. It's a self-financing, self-funded position. And that position would cost me $19.42 today. So guess what? The value of the call today would be $19.42. Replicating portfolios and arbitrage I use to get the value of the call today. That's called a binomial option pricing model. It's the basis for option pricing. If you understand that very simple two time period model, you're well on your way to understanding option pricing. Any questions? Now, of course, this binomial model comes with the limitations, right? If you think about any stock, we take Boeing today. If you think about what can happen in the next minute, thousands of potential prices can show up. So for, for to have any chance of this binomial model working, I've got to as time, I've got to make time really short, right? It can't be a day. In a day, too many things can happen. Let's, so let's make time one second. What can happen in the next second? Here's what can happen. Your price changes can get much smaller as you make time smaller. That's called a continuous price distribution. Or your price changes can stay, can stay large. You can have a jump. And that's called a jump process distribution. You see, why are you talking about continuous and jump process distributions? If you assume that price changes get smaller as time gets shorter, that binomial model that you just saw, saw condenses into what's called the Black-Scholes model. The Black-Scholes model, which gets used in option pricing around the world, is a special case of the binomial model, and it applies when price changes are continuous. If you assume a jump process distribution, a different option pricing model emerges. It's more messy, more complicated than the Black-Scholes model, and very few people, few people use it because getting the inputs to these jump process models is really messy. But the Black-Scholes model is a special case of the binomial model. And in the Black-Scholes model, the value of a call option is a function of five variables. S, which is the value of the underlying asset. K, which is the strike price. T, which is the life of the option. R, which is the riskless rate. And we see a question mark here. That should be sigma. It's a variance in the log value of the underlying asset. In a minute, I'm going to explain why it's the log value. But there are five variables, S, K, R, T, and Sigma, that drive the value of a call option in the Black-Scholes model. Now, earlier today, I said there were six variables that determine the value of an option. Do you remember? What's a missing variable in the original Black-Scholes? It seems to have only five. There seems to be a missing variable. What's a variable that's not in the Black-Scholes? You can look back at page 11 or 12 if you want to see what I had that. Dividends, exactly. The original Black Scholes model was designed to value options on stock which paid no dividends or were dividend protected. What's dividend protecting? A dividend protected option, the stock price actually gets adjusted every time a dividend gets, the exercise price gets adjusted every time a dividend gets paid. There are no dividend protected options anywhere in the world. You know why Black and Scholes ignore dividends? The mathematics of deriving the Black-Scholes model was so messy that they said, let's get rid of dividends, let's ignore them. The original Black-Scholes was designed to value non-dividend paying stocks. I'm going to give you an adaptation of the model that's going to allow you to bring in dividends, but in the original Black-Scholes, there were no dividends. And in the original Black-Scholes, here's how you value an option. The value of a call option is S, S being the, the value of the stock today, times N of D1. You're saying, what the heck is N of D1? I'm going to show it to you in a picture. In the next page it's an area under the normal distribution minus k e minus rt you see what the heck is e minus rt that's a present value factor the original black shows was designed to value what are called european options european options have nothing to do with geography european options are options that can be exercised only on the expiration day so the two-year option can be exercised only on the last day of the second year American options can be exercised any time over the next two years. Most options are American options. The Black Scholes was designed to value European options. Why? Because the math got simpler. So KE minus RT is the present value, the strike price 
because I don't have to pay the strike price till two years from now. N of D2 is also an area under the distribution. You see, what's D1 and D2? D1 is a function of S, K, Sigma, every, all of the variables that we talked about. So the key steps in getting the black Scholes is first getting the S, K, R, T, and Sigma. Then the second step is to plug those in to come up with the D1 and D2. And here's the third step. You go look up the area under the distribution that reflects. So let's say your D1 is minus 0 0.30. The area under the distribution is 0 0.3821. If you look at this N of D, N of D ranges from 0 to 1. Put simply, N of D1 and N of D2 are probabilities. N of D2 in particular is defined as the risk neutral probability that your option will end up in the money. I know this is a lot thrown at you, but let me repeat that again. N of D2 is the probability that this option will end up in the money. You know what in the money is? S being greater than K. So S is the current stock price. N of D1 is the area under the distribution that you get once you calculated D1. K is the strike price. E minus RT is a present value factor for the strike price. N of D2 is the risk neutral probability that your option will be in the money. You see, but I thought this was based on replicating portfolios. The black shoals is built on a replicating portfolio. In fact, to replicate the call, here's what you need to do. You need to buy N of D1 shares of stock. So that's like the, the, the delta we solve for the binomial. And you'd have to borrow KE minus RT times N of D2. You borrow KE minus RT times N of D2. And you buy N of D1 shares of stock. You're essentially a replicating portfolio. I don't know whether any of you plan to become option traders or be involved in option pricing. But in option pricing, you're filled with Greek alphabets. The option, delta, gamma, theta, everything is related to the replicating portfolio. N of D1 is called the option delta, the number of shares of stock that you need to buy to replicate the option. That's the option delta. The option gamma tells you what happens to the delta as the stock price changes. The option theta looks at the replicating portfolio as time changes, right, as you go from two months to one, one month and 29 days, to one month to 28 days. Everything in option pricing is built around how the replicating portfolio changes over time. So the original option pricing model is built on replication arbitrage. The binomial is a simple way to illustrate it, but the Black-Scholes is a limiting case for the binomial if you have continuous prices. So to use the Black-Scholes, first you gotta get D1 and D2. Second, you need what's called a cumulative normal distribution. That's what this distribution is which gives you the area to the, distribu the distribution to the left of whatever your D1 and D2 is. So those are the tools you need to be able to use option pricing to value an option. And we're gonna see if we can use these option pricing models to value real options. That's still mysterious because you have no idea what I'm talking about with real options, but I'll come in and fill in the details. Now I said the original Black Scholes was built on the premise that stocks are dividend protected. But we know options are not dividend protected, that stocks do pay dividends. There's a version of the black shoals that I'm going to create that takes dividends into account. And here's what you do. Instead of taking S times ND1, so you want to compare this equation to what you saw two pages ago. Instead of S times ND1, I take the stock price today and I discount the stock price for expected dividends over the life of the stock. What I'm effectively assuming is as dividends get paid, the stock price will drop. So I'm reflecting that drop by bringing in this E minus YT. It's like a present value factor for adjusting for dividends. And when I do my D1 and D2, here's the additional component that happens. In the original equation, D1 was just R plus sigma squared divided by two. Now I have R minus Y. You see, what's Y? Y is the dividend yield. So when I get a dividend yield, remember in the replicating portfolio, I borrowed money and I bought shares. When I borrow money, I have to pay the riskless rate. That's what the R is. But when I buy shares, I get dividends on those shares. So I'm netting out the dividend yield. It's, it's my overall carrying cost. And it's now smaller because I get dividends. So this is the dividend adjusted version of the Black Scholes. And this is the model that you're going to see me use when I value real options, because most real options have something analogous to dividends that you have to take into account. So I know option pricing is intimidating. You're using you know, those keys and you calculate it never used before, the log key, the exponential key. But at least understand the logic of what these mods are trying to do. They're trying to create something that looks like your option in terms of cash flows by combining the underlying asset and borrowing. 
and every single option pricing model is built on replication and arbitrage. Before we start looking at the applications, one final question. Okay? Can I use these option pricing models to value real options? Well, there are a couple of problems with using these option pricing models. These option pricing models were, were built, were actually the original models were created to value listed options on traded shares. So there, the assumption of the replicating portfolio was easily met, right? The shares were traded, the options were traded, you could borrow and lend at the risk-free rate, but with real options, you're going to run into some issues. The first is most real options get exercised early. I'll give you an example. I'm going to argue that oil companies which have oil reserves have an option to develop the reserves. And most of them will exercise those options at some point in time if the oil price rises. You know what? If you're an oil company with oil reserves, if the oil price in the next year goes to $70 a barrel, you're going to exercise early. You're not going to wait till the last day when your rights run out to do it. So early exercise is more the rule than the exception. So remember the Black Scholes was designed to value European options. Most real options are American options. And second, unlike traded assets where the stock price moves every moment of every day, the underlying assets with real options may not move continuously. And if you try to develop a binomial tree, you can go crazy. But there are cases where you could actually do decision trees as an alternative. To using option pricing. If you, you remember decision trees from, you know, I don't know which class you'd have had it in. I'm going to use a very simple example of decision trees to see why decision trees can sometimes effectively capture what you want to do without bringing out the option pricing heavy machinery. Traditional decision tree analysis, what you have is you draw branches. In every branch, you estimate probabilities, you have cash flows, and you take an expected value. There is a modified version of the decision tree analysis where you can get the same answer you'd have got using option pricing models, where you allow the discount rate to vary depending on where you are in the tree. So you could argue that if you use decision trees right, you could get, you could get pretty much the same answers you get with the option pricing models, and they're far more straightforward, far simpler to apply. So here's an example of a decision tree. It's of a pharmaceutical company that's coming up with a diabetes drug. So if you look, they're testing the drug. That's the first branch. If you abandon, so the way a decision tree is drawn is if you draw an, if you abandon something and you draw X is saying that's the end of the tree. If you test and the test is, you decide to test and the test is successful, there's a 70% chance of success and 30% chance of failure. If it, so it can be either successful or it can fail. If it fails, you stop and you lose 50 million, whatever it costs you to test. If it succeeds, then you do follow-up tests. And the follow-up test tells you whether the, the, this diabetes drug is going to be good for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, just type 2, just type two, type 1. Or the second test can be a failure, in which case you lose even more because you've carried the test further through. So each branch of the tree, so the round branches are basically probabilistic events where you don't control it. The triangles are your decision points where you decide to do something. So basically I've tracked out all of the possible outcomes. And you can see the possible outcomes here range from the best case outcome of plus 887 million to worst case outcome of minus 140.91. I have the expected values. Basically, I can do the properties. And if I work the expected values back, the expected value that I get for this drug reflecting the probabilities of all of the different outcomes is 50.36. What does that mean? If I tried to sell the rights to this drug today before I even test, I would ask for 50.36 million. If I'm valuing this firm with this drug that's already come through the pipeline, the value I would attach is 50.36. It covers the, up the upside, the downside. Think of it as a less technical way of bringing the optionality into your valuation is with plain decision trees. So here are the three tests we're going to run with real options. With every real option that I'm going to identify, I'm going to say, is there an option here? And I'm going to draw a payoff diagram and I'm going to establish the contingency that's going to drive my cash flows. Because remember, there's that strike price. I'm going to create the equivalent of that. Second, I'm going to ask, is there exclusivity? If there is, I'm going to argue that there is an option value. If there's none, I'm going to argue that you should just walk away. If it's somewhere in the middle, we're going to talk about how much of the option value I should, how I should allow for. And third, I'm going to ask, can I use an option pricing model to value the option? And here the test becomes, is the underlying asset traded? Can the option be bought and sold? And is the cost of exercising the option pretty clear? Because if those three questions are yes, yes, and yes, then I can use an option pricing model. 
For every 100 options you run into, about 10 will have exclusivity and about one or two can be valued using option pricing models. That's why I, I wouldn't get too carried away with using this model in places it shouldn't be used, but it's a good tool to have just in case. You run into that one or two out of every 100 options, we can bring the tool out to play. Any questions before we start looking at the potential applications? On options, option pricing. Now I know, you know I hit you with a lot of stuff, but you know, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to you to derive an option pricing model, but I expect you to at least understand the intuition behind an option pricing model, the replication arbitrage. So any questions on those two issues? We'll ask, are European and American options price similar? We'll want you uh, unmute yourself because I'm going to lead you through and I think you can you can see why there. Well, what is your, first, uh, for the, just for clarity, what's the difference again? So I have two options. Let's say one is an um, uh, European option, one is an American option. They're on the same underlying asset, same strike price, same maturity. What's the difference between the European and the American option? Uh, so with the American option, we can exercise it like, and time okay. during the right to alert. So an American option obviously gives you more freedom than a European option. So the question you're really asking is, is that freedom worth anything, right? Because if it's worth nothing, then you can use a European option pricing model to value American options. With listed options, that freedom is worth very little. Tell me why. Why would you never exercise a list? So if you think about an option in the CBOE, why does it almost never make sense to exercise an option early, even though you because have the right to do it? Because there's time value. So yeah, because you can sell the option at a higher price. It's a listed option. It's traded. So with listed options, you can get away using the Black-Scholes model because European and American options are going to be worth pretty much the same because the right to exercise early is there, but you never use it. But with real options, the right to exercise early is a valuable option. If you don't develop that oil reserve and oil price is 70, what could happen? Oil prices yeah, go back to drop again. Exactly. So with real options, we know American options are worth more than European options. So when I use a Black-Scholes model to value an oil reserve, think of it as a conservative estimate. Because we know that the European option can never trade for less than the American option. It can only trade for more. How much more is kind of a fuzzy number. But you know what? I'm going to use Black-Scholes option pricing models, even though a purist will push back and say, but these are you know, American options, because at least it'll give me a baseline value. I'm already way out in the limb in terms of you know, assumptions I'm making with real options, that this is the least of my worries. So the generally with listed options, European and American options are priced similarly, but with real options, American options will trade at a premium on, on European options. Thank you very much, Professor. Yeah. So now let's talk about the options where we're going to use this insight. And here's where it's going to get fun. I know the option pricing part is boring. Black Scholes binomial said, why are we spending time? Because understanding the basics of option pricing is going to let us have some fun with options. There are three classes of options I'm going to talk about. The first is the option to delay, where you have a bad investment or you have something that's not viable today, but it could be viable in the future. I'm going to argue that the right to this uh, to a technology that's not viable today could be worth the right because you can take that project in the future. So I'm going to talk about the option to delay and I'm going to use it as a platform to talk about valuing a patent or valuing undeveloped oil reserves or gold reserves or whatever natural reserves you have. The second is the option to expand, where taking one investment gives you the right to do other investments in the future. I'm going to give you a couple of examples, and I'm going to use this as a way of talking about why platforms have value. Why, when you buy a Twitter, the company might not be worth very much as an online advertising company, but you get a platform of 350 to 400 million users. Why that platform might give you a chance to do other things in the future and why that can add to your value. That's your option to expand. And the third is the option to abandon, where being able to walk away from a mistake might allow you to take investments you otherwise wouldn't have taken. The option to delay, the option to expand, the option to abandon.
All of these options have a value and sometimes they can make a bad investment into a good investment. Remember in corporate finance, you learned about net present value. What's the rule with net present value? That if the net present value is positive, you should take the project. The net present value is negative, the project is a bad project. I'm going to add some nuance to that statement. I'm going to argue that you could have a negative net present value project, but if there's enough optionality in the project, you might still end up taking the project. Sounds outlandish, but I'll back it up. So let's talk about the option to delay. Basically, the option to delay, you know, you have an exclusive right to do something, a technology, a project, you have the exclusive right to take the project. Let's assume that right now when you look at the project, the project has a negative net present value. What you have though is the right to take this project, right? So basically you could sit on this project and even though this project is a bad project today, it could become a good project in the future. I promised you that every real option I talk about, I'd use a payoff diagram. Let's convert what I just said about this project into a payoff diagram. You have the right to take the project, right? So if you decide to take the project, the initial investment in the project becomes like the strike price. You will take the project only if the present value of the cash flows from taking the project exceed that initial investment. The NPV is positive. And if that happens, you will actually convert your right into a project and take the project. But remember, that might never happen. In which case, what have you lost? You lose whatever you paid to get the rights to this project. So basically, don't translate the fact that a project has a negative net present value today into a conclusion that the rights to this project are worth nothing. You could have a non-viable technology today, but the rights to this technology could be valuable because this technology could become viable in the future. That's your option to delay a project. I'm going to use this as a basis for talking about valuing a patent. Because think about what you get in a patent. You get the right to develop a product commercially, right? That's what a patent gives you. It doesn't give you an obligation. So you have a product patent. If, let's assume that the cost of developing this patent into a commercial product is I. I know it sounds abstract, but let's leave it abstract. And that V is the present value of the cash flows you will get if you develop this product. So right now, all you have are the rights to this product. If you decide to develop the product, it will cost you I, and V is the present value of the cash flows. Let's think of it in terms of a very simple decision. If V is greater than I, you will develop the product and keep the difference. If V is less than I, you will sit on the product patent and hope it becomes viable. Hey, that looks a lot like the payoff diagram on a call option, right? If I replace V with S and I with K, it will look just like a call option. In fact, if you took a patent and drew it as a payoff diagram, here's what it'll look like. The cost of converting the patent into a commercial product becomes the strike price. The present value of the cash flows from doing that conversion becomes the S in the model. And if the S exceeds a K, the present value exceeds a cost, you would convert the patent into a product to make the difference. But of course, that might never happen. In which case, what did you lose? How did you get this patent in the first place? What are the two ways? a company can acquire the rights to a patent. How does a company end up with, with a patent? What's the most common way? You have to buy it. One is you could buy it, but if you look at a Pfizer or a Merck, where do they get most of their patents? came out of their R&D, right? So there are two ways you can do it. You can come, you can either buy it from somebody who's already developed the patent, or you can do the R&D to develop the patent. You know what? R&D is the cost you incur to get this option. Or what you pay for the patent becomes the cost. That cost is fixed. You're not going to get it back if the patent never becomes viable. You know that um, I think it is IBM has something like 16,000 patents. 16,000 patents. You think that's a lot of patents. They should be worth a lot. Most of these patents are not viable, will never be viable. They just have the right to develop the patent. They're out of the money options, if you think in option terminology. So this is basically the payoff diagram for a patent. Now you can see why I can value a patent as a call option, because that's just like a call option, right? So I'm going to ask you for the, so what's the underlying asset here? If the patent is a call option, the underlying asset is the product that comes out of the patent and the cash flows that emerge from that. 
The strike price becomes the cost of converting the patent into a commercial product. And what's the life of this option? How many years will patents run? Is it anything now? In the US, it's about 70 to 20 years. So it's not, it's not quite 70. It's not that long. It's 17 to 20 years. So basically, the life of the option becomes the remaining life of the patent. So if you buy a patent with 12 years left on it, it's like buying an option with a 12-year maturity. Now, sometimes you're going to be disappointed that patent is going to be worth nothing. But sometimes it can pay off. And that's what you're capturing with the optionality. Any question about the intuition or the logic of what we're trying to do here? So let's see how you'd get the inputs. Because if I decide to treat a patent as an option, and I want to value it as an option, I need all those inputs, right? S, K, R, T, Sigma. Let's see how we'd get that. To get the value of the underlying asset, you know what I'd have to do? I'd have to actually act like I convert the patent into a commercial product today. I'd have to compute the present value of the cash flows I would get from developing the patent today. You're saying that's going to require, you're saying that's going to be very uncertain. You're right. It's going to, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, but be glad about that. You know why? Because that uncertainty is what's going to give you your option about it. So basically, that's the first step is doing a traditional capital budgeting, acting as if you're going to develop the patent today. That becomes the S in the model. To get the variance in that value, I can either look at the variance in stock prices or cash flows of publicly traded companies in the space, or if I'm really clever, I might be able to run a simulation. Remember those Monte Carlo simulations you saw earlier when we did the I guess, valuation of Exxon Mobil? I can do a Monte Carlo simulation of my cash flows and get a variance in my present value. That becomes the sigma. So I've got S, I've got sigma. The exercise price of the option is the cost of actually making this patent into a commercial product. So I'll have to estimate how much will it cost me to build the factories to make the products that come out of this patent. That becomes the K. So I've got S, I've got Sigma, I've got K. The expiration of the option is the remaining life of the patent. Remember, I started at 17 years, but each year I hold on, it becomes 16, 15, it's the remaining life. And here's the trade-off. We talked about options being European or American options. You definitely don't want to make the patent a European option. You know why? What if you have 15 years left in the patent and you wait till the very last day of the 15th year to exercise your right? What do you lose? You lose all that protection you'd have got if you developed it earlier. So once this option becomes viable, I'm going to argue that there's a cost to delay. That cost to delay is very much like a dividend yield. This is one of the trickiest parts of real options. I want the intuition to be clear about what I'm doing here. I'm introducing a cost to waiting. Because if I don't have a cost to waiting, then you're going to sit on this patent till the very last day. Of the very last year, you have the rights to this option. And that makes no sense. So once this option becomes viable, I'm going to say, are you going to exercise now? Because if you wait, you're going to give up some of your protection. In fact, I'm going to use a very simplistic proxy for how much you give up. If there are 15 years left in the patent, if you wait an extra year, you're giving up 1 15th of whatever protection you've got. That becomes like a dividend yield. Remember the dividend yield protected uh, Black-Scholes model that I created? This will become the equivalent of the dividend yield. I know it's incredibly abstract, so let me make this real with an example. This is actually an example of where I was able to get the hands. It's very difficult to get the numbers on a real-world patent example because they're internal numbers. Pharmaceutical companies don't get let you see them. But you, I got lucky on this. This was a long time ago. When Biogen, a biotechnology firm, developed a patent on Av uh, Avonex, which is a drug to treat MS, and they just develop, they just acquired the patent when I did this valuation of the patent as an option. They had 17 years left on the, on the patent. And here's what the numbers look like, and here's where I got lucky. I don't know whether you've ever seen how pharmaceutical companies do cash flows on a drug, but it's actually very, it's a very morbid exercise. So here's what Biogen had done. They projected how many people in the U.S. had MS. So they, the percent of the population, they said, well, I think, you know, 11 million Americans have MS. Then they said, what percentage of those 11 million people will go to a doctor? And it's not 100%. 
So let's say 90% go to a doctor. So 90% of the 11 million is 9.9 .9 million go to a doctor. Then they ask what percent of the 9.9 .9 million who go to a doctor get the correct diagnostic diagnosis that this is MS and it's not 100%. Let's say it's 75%. 75% of 9.9 .9 million is 7.5 million. Then they say, what percent of the 7.5 million have health insurance? And what percent of that group will end up taking Avenex? By the time they're done, maybe 2 or 3 million will end up on Avenex. That becomes the basis for projecting the cash flows. And they've done that. And that's where I got lucky. I was able to get my hands on a capital budgeting exercise done by Biogen. And they projected that the present value of the cash flows, if they developed Avenex immediately, would be 3.422 billion. So that's the present value of cash flows if they develop the drug now. Avenix, Biogen had never actually produced a full drug before. They'd been around, but they'd always licensed their drugs out to other pharma companies. But their plan with Avenix is they were going to produce the drug themselves, which would require you know, building plant and equipment and physical you know, sales teams. And they estimate the cost of converting the patent into an actual commercial drug would be 2.875 billion. Let me pause right there. If this were a capital budgeting problem, if the present value cash flows of introducing the drug is 3,422 million and the cost of developing the drug is 2,875 million, what's the net present value of the project? How would I compute the net present value? It's just going to be the difference between the two numbers, right? 3,422 minus 2,875. My net present value would have been 547 million. So in a traditional DCF basis, this drug is worth 547 million. Hold on to the 547 million because I'm going to value this drug as an option. Why? Because Biogen has not developed the drug yet. They have 17 years when they can wait. The riskless rate then was 6.7%. And there's uncertainty in the future, uncertainty about what, how big the market is, how much they can work on reducing side effects in the drug and increasing its cash flows, what other diseases it could be used to cure. So I'm going to capture that uncertainty by using the variance in stock prices of other biotechnology firms. I could have done a simulation, but I really didn't have the ammunition to do it. And that standard deviation was 0.224. So here's what's happening. They have the rights to the drug. They haven't developed it yet. If they develop it today, the net present value is 547 million. But there's uncertainty in the future. And if they wait, the net present value could get even higher. There is a cost to delay. Why? Because the drug is already viable. By waiting one year, they're going to give up one out of the 17 years of protection. So one divided by 17 is 5.89%. So that becomes like your dividend yield. Why? So I have S, K, R, T, Sigma, and Y. I went back and plugged it into this dividend yield adjusted black scholes model if you remember there's it just so sk so basically i just plug numbers into this model and what i got as my d1 and d2 came from those inputs so i've got d1 and d2 n of d1 and n of d2 and i come up with the value of the call option 907 million Let's see what does that even mean you know what the net present value was? Remember, it was 547 million. I'm actually valuing the rights to this drug at 907 million. About that's about 360 million dollars higher than my net present value. Saying so where's the value, the additional value coming from? It's coming from the fact that I still haven't developed it. That there's a value to waiting. The value to waiting exceeds the cost to delay. That's actually bad news for you if you have MS, right? Because what am I saying here? If you were advising Avenex, uh, Biogen, you'd say, wait, don't develop the drug right now because the minute they develop the drug, the net present value becomes 547 million. Right now, the value of the drug, the drug uh, undeveloped is higher than the value of the drug developed. You think, will that ever change? I actually track the value and because remember each year that you go through this game, even if nothing else changes, the cost to delay is going to change, right? So if I wait one year, there's 16 years left. And I do the same thing, cost of delay is going to become 116th and 115th and 114th. Even if nothing else changes, the value of the option is going to keep decreasing because the cost of delay is going to keep mounting. Holding all else constant, I will develop the drug, but I will develop it, develop it in about seven and a half years. If you're a monopoly drug company, you might hold off on developing a patent even after it becomes viable because there's a value to waiting. 
You know what really happened here? Biogen actually developed Avenex almost immediately. They didn't wait seven years. So what do you think I'm missing in my analysis that leads me to a different conclusion? Why am I telling them to wait to develop, but they develop almost immediately? What's the weakest link in my argument? Anybody want to try? How many years of protection am I assuming they're, they're going to have? 17 years, right? But is that true? It's true. Nobody else can develop Avenex over the next 17 years. But having a patent on Avenex doesn't prevent other pharmaceutical companies from working on their own drugs to treat MS. What if Merck is working on an MS drug and they're only five years before it's going to become commercial? You know what's going to happen to my cost to delay? Instead of being 1 17th, it's going to be 1 5th. If I put 20% as my cost to delay, the value of the option actually drops below 547 million. In the case of most pharmaceutical companies, when you use an option pricing model to value a patent and use the actual patent life, you're going to overvalue the patent because you're not the only game in town. There are other drug companies working on cures. So if a pharmaceutical company comes in with a cure for COVID, forget about the moral and the ethical reasons why they should rush that drug to the market. There are 50 other pharmaceutical companies all working on coming up with a cure. If you were the first, you should be out there right away because there is no value to waiting. You should develop the drug. There's no optionality there even though you might get 17 years of protection against competition on that particular drug. So that's the option argument. You can see how it can be used to value patents that companies possess. Any questions in valuing a patent as an option? No questions? So, you, you, uh, can you ask, uh, first let me ask, uh, you asked a question which is, wouldn't you use NPV instead of option pricing? The two are not mutually exclusive. In, or, in order to do the option pricing, what did I start with the NPV? If the optionality disappears, which is what I'm arguing with competition, you will fall back on NPV. So you'd still use NPV, right? So that's always going to be the option. I'm just saying the option premium disappears if you don't have protection against competition. Sam? Yeah, I just had a similar question because we were saying that maybe this lifetime value disappears so we don't have a like a benefit from delaying. Yeah. So in that case, is there a way to like adapt the equation? To yeah, basically make this. Approach? So let's say you have only three years before a competitor is going to come up with a drug. Just make your Y one over three. That will make your cost to delay 33.33%. You plug that into the model, the value of the option will drop to 400 million, less than the NPV, which means you should develop right away. So the easiest way to adapt it is through the cost to delay. It'll be to whenever the next competitor is going to come up with the product, right? So it's not going to be the remaining life of the option. It's going to be one over whenever the next competitor is going to come up with the product. The more competitive the space is, the smaller that number is going to be. Okay. But we don't usually have like access to that information, right? Well, you know what who, what company. So you will not have the access to this information. So for this to work, you actually have to go work for Merck or Pfizer. So if you go work in the finance department, you know, one of the things you will have is all of this information. You also know your competitors. So you will have everything you need within a pharmaceutical company. From outside, it's more difficult to get this information as an investor looking at the company. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? So now I'm going to kind of close the loop with Biogen. I was interested in valuing Biogen as a company. Remember, all I've done is valued Avenix, one big patent. It was their biggest patent then, so I valued the patent. But I was interested in valuing Biogen as a company because as an investor, I can't buy Avenix. I can buy Biogen, the company. So in fact, there is a way I can value Biogen that is different from the DCF and the pricing we've already done. And here's how you could do it. You could value their commercial products. Remember I said they already had some drugs out there which they'd licensed out. You can take the value of their existing commercial product using DCF. Then you can value the patents like Avenix using option pricing. And then there's a third layer you have to bring in. 
The R&D department at Biogen has not been fired. They're still working on new patents. So you've got to estimate how much value will be created by that ongoing R&D. Value of commercial products plus value of existing patents plus value of any new patents that might come from R&D. That last number is going to be really messy to estimate, but I'm going to try it anyway. So you ready? Let's try the, completing the Biogen valuation. At the time that I valued Biogen, as I said, there are two other commercial products that had been licensed out to pharmaceutical companies. They were collecting a fixed license fee. There are two ways you can set up a licensing agreement. One is you can get a percentage of revenues, but that's riskier, or you can have a fixed license fee. In this case, Biogen had a fixed license fee where they're going to make 50 million in after-tax cash flows each year for the next 12 years for these two commercial products. So I had to value what's 50 million for the next 12 years worth. It's a present value problem, right? The only unknown is what discount rate should I use? I use the pre-tax cost of debt of the pharmaceutical companies that had licensed the patents. So let me ask you a question. Why am I discounting these cash flows at the pre-tax cost of debt of the, of the pharmaceutical companies rather than the cost of capital for Biogen or the cost of equity? I mean, of all these choices, why did I pick the pre-tax cost of debt of the pharmaceutical companies that had licensed these products? It's a rule on discount rates. Discount rate should reflect the risk in the cash flows, right? What's the only risk that I will not get the 50 million? It's a, let's say Pfizer and Merck are the two companies that have guaranteed me the 50 million. The only way I'm not getting the 50 million is Pfizer or Merck goes bankrupt. The default risk is not at the level of Biogen, it's at the level of Pfizer and Merck. I use the pre-tax cost of debt because the only risk in the 50 million is the default risk in Merck and Pfizer, and that's captured in that pre-tax cost of debt. That's why I use the 7%. Let me ask you a follow-up question. What if Medicare had licensed these drugs and guaranteed 50 million? What discount rate would I have used then? If instead of Pfizer and Merck, Medicare had been the guarantor. Anybody want to try? So I have 50 million licensing fees, but now Medicare is guaranteeing that 50 million every year for the next 12 years. What should my discount rate be? It should be the risk-free rate, exactly. Connor said risk-free, Andrew said risk-free, that's exactly right. Hold on to that principle because I think we're in a hurry often to use cost of capital. It's, I mean, you want to use all the nice tools you've developed, the bottom-up betas, you know, synthetic ratings, cost of capital. But sometimes the answer is right in front of you. If a cash flow is guaranteed by the U.S. government, the risk-free rate is what you should use as the discount rate. So in this case, 50 million guaranteed by pharmaceutical companies. I use the pre-tax cost of debt of those companies. I come up with the value of 397.13 million. That's the value of my existing products. To value my future R&D, I made some assumptions. First, I assumed that Biogen would spend 100 million R&D every year, growing at 20% for the next 10 years and 5% thereafter. So I'm making an assumption about R&D spending. This was the bigger assumption though. I assumed that every dollar invested in R&D creates about a dollar 25 in value. What am I basing that on? I'm basing that on Biogen's past. They've been a pretty efficient R&D company. Remember when we valued Amgen, we talked about how efficiently is R&D generated? If you have a company with a history of good R&D, then every dollar you invest in R&D will create more than a dollar in value. In the case of Biogen, I'm assuming a dollar 25 in value. But that after year 10, it's going to become a zero excess return business. I'm also going to assume that this component, future R&D, is much riskier than the rest of my cash flows, and I'm going to attach a 15% discount rate. So here's what I have as my value of future R&D. There's my R&D cost every year, 100 million, growing at 20% a year. Remember, I make a dollar twenty-five for every dollar in R&D. So the value of patents that I expect to create in year one, 120 million times 1.25 is 150 million. I'm creating 30 million in extra value. So if you look at the, this column, the column in excess value, that is the value that I'm creating every year for the next 10 years. What happens after year 10? Remember, after year 10, I earn my cost of capital. So R&D becomes non-value creates value neutral. So I take the excess value that I create for the next 10 years, discount them back 
at a 15% discount rate and I get a present value of 318.3 million. I'm almost home. I have three slices for Biogen. I have the 397.13 million. That's the present value of the licensing fees. 907 million. That was the only patent they had. It was the Abinex patent. Values is an option. Plus 318 million, which is the value of future R&D, gives me a value of 1.622 billion. It's the value of my operating assets. They had no debt outstanding and very little cash. I subtracted. So basically, I just divided by the number of shares outstanding, 35.5. I get a value per share of $45.7. So I can value some companies using this approach, but be careful. If you try this on Merck or Pfizer, you're going to go crazy. You know why? They have hundreds of patents. Imagine doing what I did for Avenix for every single patent. So as a company gets larger, it's better to do that top-down approach where you value the entire company. But if you have a young pharma company, a young biotech company with a single product accounting for the bulk of its value, a new drug for malaria, a new drug for diabetes that's working its way through the pipeline, either use that decision tree that I described earlier on or use this approach valuing the patent as an option because there the bulk of your value comes from patent and you want to focus your attention on that patent. But that's, uh, that's the advantage of having this new toolkit is there are some companies that you might not be able to value using traditional models that you will be able to use an option pricing model. So I know today's session was a little dense and a little tricky and a little difficult. You know, it's always difficult for everyone. So if you felt it was a bit of a climb, you don't, don't feel alone. This is always going to be the case. Go back and review the slides. Listen to the session again if you want to. If you have questions, email me. I'm going to have you know, extra office hours this week to make up for last week. So I'll have one hour tomorrow and two hours on Thursday and you know, probably an hour on Sunday before the, before the next quiz. And as all of you should know by now, the next quiz is not till the 27th, next Monday. So we'll have four hours of office hours between now and then. This is not included in the next quiz. Real options are not included. So you can heave a sigh of relief. And, it will cover only packet two. Packet two is dense enough by itself, but it'll cover pricing. It'll cover private company valuation. So it's an asset-based valuation. So everything in packet two is what's covered in the quiz. So you don't need this for the next quiz, but you will need it for the final. So any questions before we sign off? Adrian S, is the final going to be cumulative? Yes, it is going to be cumulative, but it is going to be, the, the weighting is going to be towards, because we, we wouldn't have tested real options and acquisition valuation, I will have 40% of your final exam will come from what we did after the third quiz, roughly speaking. So it is going to be cumulative, but in a sense, that's always going to be the case, right? Because if you can't unlever and relever betas, now you're in trouble, no matter which part of the class you're looking at. So it, it, it is a cumulative final. It will be a two-hour final, no? and it will be multiple choice just like the quizzes. But um, we'll, get, we'll talk more about it as we get closer to the final. Any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, I'm going to sign off, and I will talk to you on Wednesday. Take care. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you.